Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, got an interesting topic. Uh, the topic today is going to be how scoliosis impacts the upper cervical spine and how sometimes that can mimic craniocervical instability or cause it as well. So as usual, I'll, I'll go through uh, a short didactic lecture, five, 10 minutes. Then we'll open it up to questions. You can either ask questions about the topic today or really anything else that interests you. Uh, so let me see here. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Well, let's see if I can do it. Well, we'll try the entire screen. Uh, regrettably, this is a massive screen, so it may not work that well. Let me go ahead and I'm going to make some quick changes to this presentation. So it will show in a window. Uh, again, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, how scoliosis can impact uh, CCI here. Okay, hopefully that will work now. So let me go ahead and present that. Yeah, it looks like that's working. So uh, let me go ahead and share just that window. Okay, so the topic of today's discussion is how does scoliosis impact CCI? I'll give a short lecture and then answer any questions that anyone has. Uh, so uh, we're gonna be talking mostly about kyphoscoliosis. Um, and that is kyphosis, as you see there on the right, plus scoliosis. So kyphosis is that forward head position scoliosis is side bending of the spine. So the two together, when you've got that forward head, rounded shoulders, uh, upper thoracic bent forward posture and side bending of the spine uh, as well is called kyphoscoliosis. And that's the most common thing I see these days. The kyphosis piece is just societal. It's, it's from doing this all day and not really paying attention to opening all this up. And over time, you get changes in shape of the bones that are almost irreversible. Uh, the scoliosis piece tends to be uh, usually genetic. Uh, it's more common in tall women, for example, than it is in shorter women or in uh, men. So the first thing that you have to know to understand how scoliosis, meaning side bending of the spine, can impact the upper neck is that side bending and rotation in the spine are coupled motions. So what that means is if you side bend the spine, you always get rotation with it. Um, it's the way the spine is designed. It's designed to rotate when there's side bending. So pretty simple design there and it's a design constant, if you will. So if you get side bending or scoliosis, you're going to get rotation as well. And hence, scoliosis causes a fixed rotation at C1-C2. So if you've got scoliosis or side bending below that, you're getting rotation there of C2 relative to C1. And so you're going to see rotation at C1-C2. Now, it can happen the other way, right? You can have problems at the upper cervical spine that give bad proprioceptive information that can cause a scoliosis. But you can also get a scoliosis that leads to the C1, C2 rotation, which is what we're seeing more of as time goes on. Um, and this fixed rotation of the upper cervical spine is going to cause abnormal forces at C1 and C2 and the upper cervical joints in general. It can also lead to pressure on the neurovascular bundle on one side, so that's the internal jugular vein, cranial nerve nine, cranial nerve 12, uh, 
10, meaning vagus, et cetera, and irritation of the occipital nerves. So how does kyphosis impact craniocervical instability? So we've talked about the side bend, right? Scoliosis. But kyphosis, that forward head position, stresses those upper cervical ligaments. It can irritate the occipital nerves. I, I think I saw someone put a question in there about the concept of can it mess with the myodural bridge? It can. So we know that if you've got this forward head posture, you're stressing out your upper neck. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the weight of the head, if it's balanced relative uh, to the forces your body has to use to keep your head up, goes way high as that head comes forward. Uh, because it's the proverbial problem of balancing a bowling ball on a stick. So how does long-term kyphoscoliosis impact the cervical ligaments? Obviously, it can cause them to get stretched out. Now, this may not be uh, upper cervical instability in its purest sense, however. And what I mean by that is at the end of the day, this, what we we may not be seeing this being actually unstable. It may be in its happy place, so to speak, in that it's stretching these ligaments and the ligaments are tight with that rotation. Um, and unless we were to correct it, it's not going to be unstable. But the person is still getting upper cervical symptoms. We can also see a frankly unstable uh, upper cervical spine with scoliosis patients as well. So this also explains why some patients get pretty good temporary relief with upper cervical chiropractic. That is, there's this fixed rotational force going to the upper cervical spine. The upper cervical chiropractor does their best to put it back in place. And the patient feels fine for a while, but eventually that rotational force coming up from the bottom because of that scoliosis causes it to go out again because that's its happy place. Uh, now, it may not be its happy place from the standpoint of causing symptoms, but it's its happy place from a biomechanical standpoint. And what if you're in the situation, and I've seen more of this lately, where we have really no evidence of CCI uh, with regard to diagnostic imaging, but the patient has kyphoscoliosis and they have CCI-like symptoms. It's still a highly specialized <clears throat> treatment to try to get these people better, but it usually doesn't involve tightening those internal ligaments like we would in a patient with something like type 2B alar ligament instability. So the game plan in those patients is obviously to treat the areas that are causing CCI symptoms with orthobiologics, and then selectively tighten the ligaments and fascia to try to reduce the advancement of the scoliosis over time. And that's as simple as tightening down the intertransverse ligaments, as you can see there in that left picture on the side of the convexity, and then tightening thracal dorsal fascia with that rotation just on one side. Now, that's not gonna get rid of the scoliosis, it's just going to help buttress the spine to prevent it from getting worse because it's a little bit like a game of Jenga, right? You start pulling out those little blocks and eventually the thing leans a little bit and then you pull out the last block and it goes over. Meaning that scoliosis has a tendency to get worse as it gets worse. Um, so gravity starts to take over. So you get a little bit out of the perpendicular and then it gets easier to get more out of the perpendicular and it gets far easier to get more out of the perpendicular. So the goal is to try to reduce the advancement of the scoliosis and provide some buttress. There's obviously also things like Scroth Physical Therapy, S-C-R-O-T-H, for those of you who are trying to write that down right now, um, where it's a type of physical therapy where they're working on left-right balance in scoliosis patients. So in summary, we see kyphoscoliosis patients who don't really have CCI, but they do have upper cervical symptoms. And these patients require a little bit of a different treatment approach. And we're seeing a, a good number of these patients out there. Um, 
especially the kyphosis thing, because since these things have come around, the, the kyphosis is epidemic in younger and younger people. Uh, so let me stop this and then we'll go to see if we've got any questions here to answer. Okay, looks like we got a bunch. So, uh, AT, thoughts on E-STEM to help get muscles back online for CCI where there is a normal muscle tension in suboccipitals is a legitimate modality during recovery and can it help? Um, as far as training E-STEM with muscles, it doesn't work all that well because you can't really get anywhere near the type of contraction that the muscle would normally generate on its own. Um, as far as whether E-STEM may make the muscles feel a little better, that, that could be for sure. AT, can restoring cervical curve help specifically the mitral bridge? Yeah, I think I answered this one during the uh, presentation. I, I think certainly getting the cervical curve and getting rid of the kyphosis is going to take pressure off of that area. So I think that's a, a good idea. AT, can leg length discrepancy play a role in CCI imaging shows? I have this in the process of getting orthotics. Sure enough, shorter leg is side with larger overhang. Yeah, and that's really just kind of what we were discussing, right? A leg length discrepancy can give you scoliosis, meaning it's going to side bend that pelvis. So uh, now I've often seen that patients with leg length discrepancies are in two categories, malleable and unmalleable. Malleable patients, um, you can change the leg length discrepancy and they'll feel better. Uh, so it's certainly something to try. Before you actually spend a lot of money on orthotics, it's probably just a better idea to put some toilet paper or uh, uh, you know, towels or something in your on that short leg side to raise you up a little bit and experiment with different heights uh, just to see and make sure that it's comfortable and helps because in the non-malleable patients, the bones have already changed shape. And if the bones have already changed shape to accommodate that leg length discrepancy, meaning the spinal bones, you're not gonna like it at all. It's gonna make things much, much worse. So before you spend money on expensive orthotics, I would experiment with your own increase in the heel uh, on that side. Uh, Mohan, if you had a patient with C0C1 joint inflammation caused by weak neck muscles, no CCI. Do you treat the joints first with PRP before starting PT or have them try PT first? Um, well, if all they've got is joint inflammation uh, due to weak muscles, it certainly makes sense to try physical therapy first. I think that patient is going to declare themselves fairly quickly, um, meaning the physical therapy is going to seem to help and the strengthening is going to help or it's going to sort of blow up uh, on that person. So um, I think physical therapy. Uh, you know, the hard part is you don't really know, do you just have inflammation in that joint or damage in that joint? Because it's not something we're going to see readily, even on a high field MRI. Uh, Mohan, if there's no arthritic changes to the facet joint, the joint cartilage has become somewhat irritated and weak from an injury four or five months ago, compare to strength like it does to ligaments and tendons. Um, I don't know what irritated and weak means in the in the context of cartilage, but we do know that PR, high dose PRP, um, not just PRP, but high dose PRP for age. So for someone my age, that would be about 15 times concentrated, which is not something you can really make in a little bedside machine. But that kind of PRP uh, does act as a disease modifying osteoarthritis drug meaning the research on higher dose PRP shows that it can help reduce cartilage breakdown. Um, and that's clinical research in randomized controlled trials. Now, what we don't really have is good clinical research showing that in acute injury to cartilage, that PRP can make it better uh, with regard to uh, actual clinical data. Now, we, we do know that from animal models, it works that way, um, but we don't actually have much clinical data on that one yet. Caleb, if I got this correct, in the absence of CCI, the key players of bobblehead feeling are likely the atrophied muscles and pain, muscle inhibition coming from the facet joints. Um, 
Well, that certainly could be. I, you know, it's the atrophy of the upper cervical muscles that we can see pretty readily on MRI would be the best explanation for why someone feels like they've got a bobblehead in the absence of true CCI. Um, and I think I've got, it's probably from two years ago, a video out there that you can you know, go to the, the YouTube channel and search. If you go to my YouTube channel and search videos and look for upper cervical muscle atrophy or C23 atrophy or multifidus atrophy, you should be able to find that video on how to read your own MRI to see if uh, that atrophy is present. Atrophy just means the muscle is much smaller than it was built. Uh, Light hope, post PICL, are there any contraindications for having a uh, green laser two times a week? Uh, there are not. Uh, Mohan, I know that you say the successful posterior PRP to C0 through two, zero through two joints, and CCI patients is roughly one in five. Uh, but what about someone who doesn't have CCI and just some cartilage irritation from an old injury? Yeah, it's only one in five in that type 2B CCI. Um, but again, if all you've got is a small cartilage injury in, let's say, the 0 1 joint, and you have someone who has the experience to put the stuff in the joint, now that's not going to be someone trying to do this under ultrasound. That's a joke when it comes to this particular type of injection. It's going to be someone who does this a couple, you know, 100 times a year or something someone who has serum fluoroscopy, someone who's using contrast, someone who has digital subtraction angiography, someone that's using high dose PRP. So the pool of people is getting smaller and smaller and smaller every time we go forward there. But if you've got someone like that who could put high dose PRP in the joint, that would be a pretty reasonable thing to do. Uh, Kathy, can inflamed joint feel fragile? Um, sure, yeah. I, I mean, if you think about, I'm not sure, yeah, maybe maybe few of you are old enough. You know, as you get older, you start to fig figure out pretty quickly what an inflamed joint feels like, and fragile is not a bad way to describe it. Uh, obviously, as we're younger, it's not something we experience a lot. Regenics, uh, it's been advanced by Harry Winston. I was told that kyphoscoliosis caused risk for complications from restrictive lung disease, recurrent pneumonia, and cardiac failure. Is that true? Only if the scoliosis component is very, very severe. Um, so there you're talking about cob angles of 40 and 50 degrees, that kind of thing, where you've got very severe scoliosis, which is changing the shape and function of the rib cage, and you've got certain organs putting pressure from, a, uh, from below onto the diaphragm above, those sorts of things, but not really in the type of kyphoscoliosis that we're talking about here, which is going to be more mild to moderate. John, if there's a gene therapy for EDS in the future, it would only benefit those caught early babies, little children, or can it also benefit people that are middle-aged? Yeah, it's a good question, John. I believe the, the gene therapies that they're currently looking at use a viral vector to insert the new instructions into that person. So it should work in older people. Now, will there be an age cutoff? I'm not sure. I don't think we have all that many um, clinical trials of actual um, high-level gene therapy being done in adults to compare to, but it should work in, in older or in non uh, should work in adult patients. Now, there could be an age limit. I don't know. Uh, John, just curious, do you see cartilage regrowth treatments in mainstream medicine in about 20 years? I think we will get to selected cartilage regrowth treatments. And what I mean by that is, you know, first we've got things like we have now. If you've got small injuries in the cartilage, things like bone marrow concentrate, high dose PRP can help, probably help those heal. Then we, then, you know, we'll get into culture expanded cells like we've been using in Grand Cayman now for almost uh, 20 years. Um, and that works a bit better. Um, and then we'll get into um, certain small molecules, uh, things like um, you know, alpha-2 macroglobulin or uh, transforming growth factor beta, uh, which can promote some repair. 
Uh, and then we'll get into genetically altered um, stem cells, which are super cells and maybe can start to bend the needle in people who've got more severe joint disease. Um, about that same time, we'll probably see 3D printed live joints that can be installed. Um, so all of that is possible and all of that is sort of on the way. I think the hard part is the regulatory apparatus, especially here in the United States, tends to slow it down pretty, pretty substantially. Meaning that if we had a, a fleeter uh, regulatory apparatus more similar to the one they have in Japan, or you can get something on the market after a phase one, two clinical trial and then collect data as you go, as long as patients understand it's in that category, uh, we'd probably be 10 to 15 years ahead of where we are now. Uh, Light Hope, uh, can SI joint instability directly affect CCI symptoms? Yeah, we see that all the time, and it's a really good question because, you know, if you think about it, the SI joints are a little bit like the foundation of a house, right? I think we'd all understand that if you go to see an old house and the foundation is cracked, and, you know, part of the foundation is down two inches on one side relative to the rest of the foundation, that the walls are going to change and the walls are going to get uneven, which is going to start to put cracks in the ceiling, which is going to start to create leaks in the roof. Um, so I think we'd all accept that at face value, that the physics of that makes common sense to us. Uh, it's the same thing in the body, right? The, the foundation there being the SI joint. So if the SI joints are unstable, you're not going to have a good base of support for the rest of the spine, which can affect the top part, which is the roof. So we often see patients who have chronic SI joint instability. And when we can, obviously, if it's a fragile egg, we can't do it at the beginning, but we will eventually work into in that patient or start there in another patient. Uh, getting the SI joint stable as part of all of that treatment. Uh, some advance by Sherry Kopp uh, is kypho or sh Sherry Scop. Is kyphoscoliosis more common in EDS? Would it affect the candidate for PICL? Um, it is more common in EDS, um, more of the scoliosis part. The kyphosis part is literally just uh, phone disease. So um, just be careful with phone disease because it's a powerful one. It, it's it's going to add a trillion dollars in healthcare costs to this next generation that the prior generation didn't have. Um, so uh, does it affect being a PICL uh, procedure candidate? No. Might it impact the outcomes if that person can't get a hold of their phone disease or if we don't try to address it? It may. Um, Liza, are you very much... Thank you very much for talking to me today. Wow. Sure. Uh, if, you have, if you have this and a whiplash, what would happen? Well, it's certainly going to make an injury to the upper cervical spine more substantial because you're going to be off left, right, and forward, back. So you're going to have certain parts and pieces, meaning ligaments, that get more stress than other types of ligament, other parts and pieces. Nick, you've talked about vertical instability in December. You mentioned that injections might be able to help someone with large BDI, but probably not someone who has cranial settling. I have a couple of questions. How do you find cranial settling in terms of measurements? I want to make sure I'm understanding the terms correctly. Are patients with very low BDI is also poor candidates for PICL? My BDI is less than two. Vertical instability appears to be my only type of instability. Uh, I have a dot, dot, dot. Um, so when it comes to when I start to get concerned is not so much a BDI measurement, but evidence that the dense is getting uh, very close to that line drawn across the uh, frame of magnum. I believe it's called Chamberlain's line. So uh, that's the concern, or if the dens is poking into the um, brain stem there, um, so it's not so much a number because uh, the, there's a pretty wide variant in normal BDI. Uh, it's more is that BDI in that person leading to compression. And realize that everything we've been talking about here, particularly the kyphosis, 
can also make that worse. Um, so uh, that's the concern. Uh, it's been advanced by Elijah. Uh, would my scoliosis risk the results of your procedure for CCI? Um, no, but just realize that it may put you in a category where we have to do repetitive ongoing treatments to keep everything as good as possible because there's chronic versus coming up from the bottom. It also would put you in a situation where we may want to treat the scoliosis as well as the CCI. And that was the reason for kind of one of the reasons for bringing this up. Uh, Kimmy, over the years, have you seen many more patients than one pupil that dilates larger than the other? I've noticed this symptom myself and watched your video on CCI and blurry vision. But at the time, it seemed like a new symptom that was just being presented to you. You know, we have seen that. I would say I've seen it in five to 10 patients so far out of the, I don't know, probably 1,000 CCI patients, well, more than that, probably 2,000 CCI patients I've seen. So it's not super common, but it's definitely out there. And the mechanism is probably the sympathetic chain mechanism that I brought up previously. Uh, John, what are your thoughts on transferable steroid epidural for a bulge nerve disc with stenosis at 5667? Four rounds of PRP and cervical ligaments help, but not entirely. Um, yeah, using high dose corticosteroids uh, in the spine epidural is almost always a bad idea. That's a million times physiologic dose. So just to give you a visual on it, if the height of this little um, AirPods container is the amount of steroid that your body is used to seeing, then we're talking in that case, uh, injecting the height of the Empire State Building in steroid dose. So there's just no reason to do it, but it's commonly done out there because doctors really don't know that. Uh, now, if we're talking about putting in a nano dose, um, a nanogram dose, which would be this height, not the Empire State Building, that could be a pretty reasonable thing to do. More reasonable would be using platelet lysate for that epidural, platelet growth factors for that epidural, because that has nerve growth factor, which can cause a positive effect on the nerve, not just take out inflammation, which is the body's attempt to heal itself. Um, so, uh, you know, just realize, though, that if there is that stenosis, um, then what should have been done is injecting into this nerve area with the platelet based solution using play, usually platelet lysate. That would be standard of care, in my opinion. And if it wasn't done in four rounds of PRP, they were just hitting the ligaments back here because they didn't have the, the uh, knowledge of how to do that, then you're really being seen at the wrong spot. Uh, Bridget, my SCM uh, scalings pull my clavicle high close to my throat. It makes me choke. I also have bulging spasms at the base of the neck and tight pectoralis and trap. Do you have injections to loosen these muscles and drop down the clavicle? Well, so the first question there, Bridget, since we're talking about scoliosis, would be, is that due to a scoliosis coming from below? If it's not, um, then the next question would be, is there laxity in the sternoclavicular joint and ligaments that are pulling that clavicle up? Um, and does that need to be tightened? Uh, and then the next question would be, what's causing the scalenes uh, and SCM to pull there? And usually it's instability, so that's got to be treated. So it's not really an injection to treat the tight muscle. Um, you can do Botox there, but that's not going to last more than three months, and it damages the muscle. It's why is that happening and that's really what we're talking about here today for everything right it's why is it happening you always have to get to why um you know physicians are not incented these days in our boom 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 got to see 20 30 patients a day environment um to get to why they're just focused many times on the symptoms so a good example there would be oh I'll just botox that it's tight tight means i do botox but we still don't know why. If we don't know why, we can't help you long term. Uh, Levon, hi, Dr. C. Assuming bones haven't changed shape, how does age range for scoliosis correction look like? Obviously, the younger the better, 
But what age do you think window is likely completely closed? Yeah, it's a good question to leave out. A lot depends on whether or not the scoliosis reduces when you lay down. Uh, in some patients, the scoliosis goes away when they lay down, and they can be into their 30s and 40s without getting changes in, the, in bone shape. In other patients, it doesn't. So it's, again, that whole malleable, not malleable thing. And um, in those situations, we're really talking about um, much harder to, to change, right? Because the, the shape of the blocks, so to speak, the vertebrae that make up the spine is no longer uh, the same. Could a five, six bulge cause occipital is very tender uh, or could it be for a military neck? Um, it's possible that a 5-6 bulge could uh, shut off the local stabilizing muscles and cause tightness in the muscles that go all the way up to the skull. So that's possible. Also, it can be from loss of the cervical lordosis. Also, it can be from injury up here. All of those things. Uh, Kimmy, type 1A and 2B here. I've been getting some relief with AO for six years now, but I'm far from symptom-free. I'm not quite understanding how tightening ligaments of PICL can help symptoms if I'm still symptomatic when alignment. Maybe I'm just overthinking or not thinking of CCI in the correct way. Yeah, it's not so much alignment. It, instability means that things move around too much. Uh, so that means that things are getting out of place as you move and the ligaments aren't protecting those joints, they're not protecting the surrounding nerves, et cetera. So that's how tightening ligaments in CCI patients reduces those symptoms. Um, alignment is, in, in this case, is a static concept, right? It looks like it's turned some, so we're gonna to try to turn it back. That's different from every time I do something, it does this, and it's all that extra motion, which is causing the havoc. Edwin, I may have Meniere's disease, and Valtrex is often used to prevent attacks. I swear it is not well known, but plenty of doctors uh, prescribe it. Do you know if Valtrex and Cyclovir would interfere with the Regenix procedure? Um, uh, could it interfere with the Regenix procedure? Probably not. Um, and again, uh, Meniere's disease is, isn't really a diagnosis. It's a, it's a description of symptoms. So the question is, if you are dizzy, why are you dizzy? Um, so I would really ask that question because, you know, Meniere's disease is a black box in which we put people where they're dizzy and we don't know why, so we'll call it Meniere's disease. you got to get to why. Could be caused by the inner ear, could be caused by the upper cervical spine, could be caused by problems with vision, could be a brain tumor. Lots of different things can cause dizziness. So the question becomes why? Uh, how common is the germ of hypomobility in lower areas for CCI patients? Are there any treatments more conservative for this specific to try before the biologics? Sure, um, you can always try manual therapy, whether that's um, you know, manual physical therapy where they're trying to mobilize the lower cervical spine uh, or whether that's actually chiropractic in that area. All of those things in the lower cervical spine uh, would be fine to try to improve that motion. Uh, if you've got CCI, obviously you don't want anyone but an AO or NUCA chiropractor adjusting the upper neck. Uh, Ryan, how you see what's the best way to diagnose kyphosis and what is the treatment game plan if you have both type uh, 2B CCI and kyphosis scoliosis? Yeah, Ryan, the best thing to do is just to look at your you know, lateral neck, upper back x-ray or MRI and, and see if you've got a forward head posture. Um, you know, there are numbers, but that's more complex to explain. And you can also tell, right? You know, you can look at a, a relatively young person and see how their head and neck generally are over the thoracic spine. And you can look at someone with kyphosis. A lot of older people have kyphosis and you can see their head juts forward and this part back here at the base of the neck starts to stick out. Uh, Kimmy, I see a lot of people at CCI talking about feeling loose and unstable, but I feel very restricted and tight. Is this rigidity likely caused by overactive, overactive too tight muscles? Yeah, because that's the body's response to instability, which is spasm. So spasm is one 
of the ways the body will try to make things stable. Uh, Neil, what's your experience regarding muscle memory post PICL? Specifically, do you have an idea as to how long muscles like SCM can take to rebalance to improve ligament health? Uh, well, it's the instability driving the muscle tightness. So the muscles generally get less tight as the instability goes away. Having said that, that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of muscle work to do, which is why we have those post-CCI exercises. Manuela, uh, injury two years ago, three PACLs. So far since then, SCM and trap muscles are now starting to fire up. Does, does that could mean my instability is not improving? Could these still fire up even though instability is getting better? Uh, we'll do DMX soon and check the overhang uh, improvement. Yeah, Manuel, Manuel, probably best to do a DMX to try to see if things are heading in the right direction, meaning uh, are they turning back on or uh, is the that approach not working for you? Sean, if you have mild thoracic scoliosis, 13 degrees, some loss of uh, lordotic curve, not quite military neck and rotated C1, C2 is feasible to do by a physics, scroll therapy, and AO chiropractic at the same time. That's a lot to do. Um, I would say of those, I'd probably focus on Scroth and AO, given what you've described, just because it's pretty hard to do all three of those at once. Ryan, I had posterior cervical injections in early December. Uh, is there a recommended waiting period for moving forward with PICL procedure? Um, yeah, Ryan, you're kind of uh, you're kind of there at this point here. What we're on one five, so it's been about four weeks. So if you're really not noticing a change at four weeks then that would be the time to think about that. Mohan, Dr. Fraser Henderson and Dr. Sunil Patel both looked at my DMX and flexion extension and said no instability. They ever found moderate muscle atrophy. They said it's causing my C0, C1 joint inflammation. Could be uh, or could have nothing to do with that. Um, so if you've got muscle atrophy, that's that upper cervical atrophy that we were talking about before, that can certainly lead to instability. Uh, so the Next question would be, um, how do you uh, how do you treat that? So it's certainly reasonable to try physical therapy and strengthen those upper cervical muscles and try to see if that improves. If it doesn't improve and it just pisses it off, then you've got to treat the C0C1 joint as well. Uh, Edwin, a uh, bit confused. Regenix works, obviously, but it can't regrow cartilage in the knee. Elsewhere, if I did regenic stem cell therapy for my hallux injury, would cartilage regrow? Uh, if you've got severe degeneration due to hallux, no, that's not uh, how this whole thing works. Uh, that's a common misconception or scam online where they're claiming they can regrow this or regrow that, but that's not how this works at all. Brian, trying to find a clinic for an acquaintance who has AVN of the mandible. Is this something the average Regenix Rive clinic could treat? Does your clinic have the experience treating the jaw? Yeah, Brian, we do treat the jaw. I had a patient reach out to me not too long ago who had uh, some osteonecrosis of the jaw. I've treated several jaws like that. I don't know how many other providers have treated jaws. Um, uh, I don't really focus in that area anymore. Um, and I would say it's probably going to be pretty hard to find a provider who can do that. Um, so you might look at Centeno Schultz, um, where you know you're dealing with much higher level uh, interventional orthobiologics provider who providers who may feel comfortable with that. Um, if you want to send me an email directly, you know I can try to ask some people. Uh, to see who's got some experience in treating the mandible. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's obviously staying away from the, the nerves that need to be there and getting a trocar into the jaw itself into that area. But obviously, you, you may find providers who are comfortable with that because they've done thousands of similar procedures in other areas. But many times, they'll probably say, I'm not a dentist, I don't want to do that, or I'm not an oral surgeon. Uh, Levon, can reversed or straightened cervical curve impact the rest of the spine geometry, causing the mirror cervical spine curves and become straighter? Um, yes, that's kind of what happens. But the spine is a single unit. 
what happens in the lumbar spine happens in the cervical spine and vice versa. So um, that's kind of how it all works and comes together. So yes, that is um, how it, it functions. Uh, John, can you recommend a Regenix near me that can do the 5.6? The place I went only did 6.7 because the Regenix near me said 5.6 was too risky for epidural. Um, yeah, John, so really we'd be talking about a facet overfill, not an epidural. So if you have uh, less room in the cervical spine at that spot, that's probably the concern about doing an epidural there, meaning doing a transpyramidal or interlaminar epidural. But you can do the same thing by overfilling the facet joint. So the Regenix clinic that you're going to may not know that, maybe a lower level, less experienced clinic that doesn't understand that. Um, so if you just want to send me an email directly, I'll try, and, and obviously you can tell me more because it's not a good idea to put your personal health information out there, um, then I'll try to reach out to that clinic and explain what they need to do to get that 5-6 level. Mohan, have you ever read the study done in whiplash patients that have a reduction of atrophy and fat deposits after 10 weeks of neck strengthening? Pretty cool. Um, yeah, those are studies done by Jim Elliott, um, and I think there's some uh, evidence that you can get some of that back. So that's all very, very promising. Jim used to be our physical therapist way back in the day. He then went and got a PhD down under and then came back and is now a professor in physical therapy at Northwestern doing research on this topic. So uh, very, very, very cool stuff. Bo, is it okay to take melatonin to help me sleep at night uh, post-PICL? Yeah, no problem, Bo. Uh, Kimmy, would there be an issue with Bonnie or Dramine use the day before PICL? No, I don't know what bonine is. That may be a, a, an XUS specific, uh, but Dramamine is fine, and similar drugs would be fine. Uh, Levon, does it make sense to perform curve correction if you don't get a flare-up? but you do have muscle spasm, which could indicate instability. Also, does muscle spasm always indicate instability? Uh, muscle spasm doesn't have to indicate instability. You can get muscle spasm from a pissed off nerve or a pissed off joint. Um, and if you've got a little bit of muscle spasm with it, that's okay. But if you're having a lot of muscle spasm, it's probably not the right thing for you. Ed or Edwin, for what is Worth, there's strong evidence that near disease I mentioned is caused by some sort of herpes family virus dominant in the vestibular nerve. That's why I mentioned Valtrex. I only have two other urologists, vertigo or migraine and autoimmune. Uh, not true. Um, well, uh, listen, with regard to why Valtrex would work, we wouldn't have a clue at this point. Uh, meaning, is it working through that mechanism? Is it working through another mechanism? Obviously, if it's a viral illness affecting the eighth cranial nerve, then that's a reasonable thing to try. As far as vertigo is concerned, there's cervicogenic vertigo. Uh, there's obviously injury to the eighth cranial nerve. There are inner ear problems as well. Uh, Migraine vertigo is usually confused with cervicogenic vertigo, meaning the same joints that end up causing vertigo also cause headaches. So that's probably not a valid one. That's probably, uh, again, another black box that doesn't make much sense. Uh, autoimmune vertigo, again, what's the structure being impacted? Um, so again, we're talking more black boxes versus causes. Nick, uh, thoughts on patients with the cranial settling, getting a PICL and wearing a halo at the same time. This would be counteract effects of gravity. My BDI is low and my DENS is two to three millimeters above terms of line. I would like to avoid a fusion. Um, you know, Nick, the concern is you're going to destroy all the muscles. So uh, it's going to be six and one half dozen the other. Um, you know, the halo will destroy the muscles and the muscles are needed for stability. So that's a hard one um, to, to think about. Um, so I don't know that I'd feel comfortable with that. It may just be better to get a, a, a fusion. 
because the, the treatment is going to cause as much havoc as the problem. Uh, Levon, can cervical bulges impede, hamper CSF flow, and cause artifacts in MRI along the spinal cord? I mean, if you've got a CSF flow study, you can certainly see disruptions in CSF flow from disc bulges. Uh, Mohan, so if I'm thinking right, the C0, C1, PRP would buy me time to comfortably do PT without pissing off the joint. Um, yeah, that's one way to think about it for sure, that if the joint is feeling better, it's going to be easier to strengthen, meaning when joints are aggravated or bursa are aggravated, that's another example, the area gets shut down. Um, so getting that part comfortable is a critical part of strengthening uh, for sure, meaning if your strengthening is irritating the part, then your body tends to shut down the muscles. Uh, got it, no cartilage regrowth, but surely there's some ligament and tendon regrowth, also joint stem cells in the helix, mild to moderate chronic injury. Um, I, yeah, I would need to know a lot more to get a, a good sense of what we're talking about here specifically, uh, Edwin. Ryan, uh, say if I have additional issues such as SI issues, kyphosis, shoulder pain, for example, does this need to be treated prior doing a PICL for best chance of success? Um, it's normally treated at the same time. Uh, if that person can tolerate it. When we get into centrally sensitized patients, um, that's an issue, or fragile egg patients. In most patients, we can treat it all at the same time, and that's usually the best way to address it. Uh, John, the patient in New York with severe left TMJ dysfunction, can you help her? Um, sure, John, we, we certainly see those patients. My focus these days as I get closer and closer to retirement is more just craniocervical instability focused. Um, and um, but I'd certainly be happy to take a look and get her to one of my partners who, who do more of that kind of treatment um, these days. Now, I've treated a lot of TMJs obviously. And uh, if there's time on my schedule, I can do that. But normally my schedule these days is dominated by CCI, but I've got five other partners who I trained who would be uh, very capable of, of treating that, or maybe we can try to find her someone locally who could treat that. Bridget, can uh, CCI or AI cause tight scalp and dura without dizziness? Um, a sensation of a tight scalp, uh, maybe that would be not something that we hear commonly talked about as an index symptom, but it's also hard to put in context, so we'd have to put that in context, meaning patients describe things in different ways. And so it, one of the challenges of being a doctor is to try to take all of that in the funnel and just see if it fits. Uh, so it could just be a different way of explaining what other patients report. Kimmy, are there certain issues you've seen in patients that have received PICL that made them less than desirable results in the years before in PICL? There are certain types of patients that you won't treat now that you would have treated when you first started. Let's see. I mean, I think the only difference now is, is number one, um, there are always patients that we wouldn't treat. Um, in fact, I just got an email, very nice email, actually, the other day. I've got to get back to that family where I had seen a patient. I said, we can't help you. She ended up getting um, surgery by, I think it was Goal, uh, the guy that developed the Goal Harms technique and is doing well now. Uh, she had an upper cervical fusion because she wasn't a candidate for what we did. And and family was very happy that I didn't try to treat it um, and sent them on to the next step. Um, I think the biggest change now is that we're more, or I am uh, more likely to identify a uh, fragile egg patient with central sensitization. And um, that's changed the flare up rate quite considerably. Um, whereas before, we would just sort of, you know, had this long laundry list of things to be treated because they needed to be treated, not really uh, thinking about, we would probably have one in four, one in five patients that were centrally sensitized. So we had a lot of people flaring up long-term that didn't need to be because we could have 
handled it differently. We could have done less treatment up front. That's probably the biggest change as far as less than desirable results. The other big change has come in with the CCI subtyping and uh, making sure that we're focusing on the right ligaments for that particular patient. So those are probably two biggest things that I think have improved results. Um, third change would be adding a second C-arm. That also made a huge difference in our ability to accurately target. And the percentage of times that we weren't able to get where we wanted to go because there was some issue during the procedure, like we couldn't keep the patient asleep because they were a low-dose naltrexone patient or a THC patient, that kind of stuff. Uh, John, hi, Dr. Tenno, a few questions. How well do PRP BMC cells work on capsular type ligaments that have a tear in them from trauma? Does the injection solution leak out of the capsule? Do regenerative injections work better or the same on band type ligaments than capsules and membranes? Um, uh, so I need to better understand what kind of capsular type injuries we're talking about, John. Uh, so maybe if you can give me some or a better sense of that. And how was that capsular injury determined? Uh, then I can probably answer that better. Isabella, I've experienced insomnia after dry needling in the trapezius muscles and rhomboid. The problem used to be used to be healed after CZ zero through seven posterior PRP treatments, but is back now. How is this possible? Yeah, I think what you may be experiencing is that in patients with instability, many times they develop muscle tension to stabilize. Um, and when that muscle tension is taken away through dry needling, the muscle, um, things go the opposite direction. They get worse. So that's what that sounds like to me, just with that little bit of information. Uh, Isabella, do the muscles loosen up and are now not able to provide stability anymore? No, I mean, so I think we were talking, Isabella, before about spasm, which is not a normal muscle function. Normal muscles contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. A spasm muscle stays in that contracted state when it shouldn't. Uh, Edwin, uh, as the doctor understands NSAID or double-edged swords that can degrade a joint long term as much as they can help, how would you recommend for just knee bursitis? It's more agitation than any injury. Would you say it's better to let it die down naturally as feasible? Or would you return gel for two days to be perfectly fine? I wouldn't use nitrile anti-inflammatory drugs other than as a rescue thing. So if you were really, really bad and needed rescue, that's one thing. But on an ongoing basis, our, the current data shows that they cause more problems than they fix. Um, so I think what I would tend to do there is if it's knee bursitis, I would, and a lot depends on how long it's been there. If it's been there just a couple of days, then I would rest it and see if it goes away. If it's been there a month, then uh, I'd probably get it diagnosed why the bursitis is happening and then treat that with orthobiologics. So a lot depends on its acuity. Uh, Isabella was thinking the muscles were pulling on the base of my skull, so I thought dry needling was maybe a good idea. Yeah, it would seem so, and in some patients it is, but in patients with a lot of instability, it tends to go the other direction because they need that stability provided by the muscle spasm. Ryan, uh, what's the best way to diagnose this? I don't issues. Uh, is there imaging or strictly symptom and physical test based? Usually symptom and physical test based. Uh, the imaging possibilities uh, for the SI joint are pretty poor at this juncture. Kathy, if someone got PRP in your joint, but at the three week mark, further irritated that joint to increase activity, can then PRP heal that recent new irritation? Uh, that depends on lots of variables, but in general, um, it, it would depend on what kind of healing we're talking about. So are we talking about, um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a good example from myself. I, my lateral collateral ligament on the right is loose. I've got a little bit of valgus in that joint, and that's why, as I get older, um, I was starting to get a, a meniscus that was unstable due to that LCL being loose. I had just some simple prolotherapy injections there about it was two and a half weeks ago, somewhere in there. Uh, and uh, I know that prolotherapy should act in tightening the ligament in that 
two to four week time frame, four weeks on the outside. And I can feel that already happening. The knee is much better. The, the meniscus isn't flipping out nearly as much. Um, now, if I were to go out and go hiking and slide down the hill and bang that knee really hard, causing a new injury, I don't think the prolotherapy I had two and a half weeks ago would make a difference. I'd probably need to get it retreated. Hello. Uh, John, I was injured by a high velocity adjustment of the Atlas and my AO cockpit said damage primarily between C0 and C1 on the right side. Um, yeah, so the question, it would be pretty impossible on manual testing to determine if the injury was to the deep ligaments, ALAR ligament, for example, or if the injury was to the capsular ligament. Um, hence, really no way to make that diagnosis. You can't do it with imaging, that's for sure. So um, you, know, you can certainly inject the capsular ligament laterally. The problem is the vertebral artery is there. So you're risking um, uh, a posterior circulation stroke by trying to go after that lateral ligament. Uh, it would be better to inject the joint intraarticular, which is, again, a very small number of providers that can do that safely with high experience levels, and um, test with something like DMX, for example, um, C1, C2 overhang to see if the internal ligament was damaged. Um, you could also test the lateral capture ligament that way, but realize there's also other ligaments there. There's the, there's the lateral AO ligament that could also be injured, which is external. There's the ALAR, which is internal, and there's the, um, the lateral capsule. Um, on DMX, you could ask, the, you could certainly see if there's gapping in the 0-1 joint, uh, which you shouldn't see at all, and not on the other side to see kind of what's going on and try to differentiate those things. So that's probably what you would do. Isabella, is there any way to resolve the insomnia issues, wait till the muscles get more stiff again, or is there anything else I can do? Well, the good news is dry needling effects don't last all that long, anywhere from three days to a week or two. So I just let it wear off and let the muscles come back again. Um, do you know any therapists can do progenics therapy in Canada? No, you know, there's there's are, are a ton of bridging Canada. So, for instance, we've got a Vermont provider on the east coast of Canada. We've got a Washington provider on the west coast of Canada, um, but no Regenix providers in Canada proper. Edwin, I think I've read once the PRP is used for muscle tears. Have Regenix ever use this, or is it always just PRP, SCP, PL, and BMAC in varying concentrations? Um, or I'm sorry, PPP. Um, yeah, PPP. Well, right now we have reasonable in vitro and in vivo data that PPP tends to help muscle satellite cells the best. So um, we definitely use PPP for uh, muscle problems. So we, you know, we use PPP every day. Um, if they're muscle problems. Now, what we, we really don't have high level clinical data that PPP is any better than PRP for muscle tears, but given the data we have, we've been using PPP for a long time in muscle tears. And that could change if next year uh, uh, a clinical study comes out comparing PPP and PRP in muscle tears, for example. That data doesn't exist at this moment. Levon, does healthy PP? PLL prevent disc bulges. It's possible to get bulges with a healthy PLL. Yeah, uh, the PLL realizes a relatively thin strip of ligament tissue that goes uh, down the back part of the spine. So realize it's a little bit like a very thin piece of duct tape. Uh, posterior lateral disc bulges go around it. Um, so uh, posterior lateral disc bulge avoids the um, uh, PLL altogether. Uh, Levon, uh, can spasm muscles choke you and cause insomnia or sleep apnea? It's possible. Um, normally, sleep apnea is, is mechanical. It could also be central. 
Um, that's often due to medications or brain issues. But um, normally, um, uh, sleep apnea is mechanical, uh, where a change in, in shape of the, the breathing tube area is what causes that problem. Uh, Kathy, isn't the facet capsule a weak stabilizer? Yes, it's a very weak stabilizers. In fact, there are parts of the facet capsules by the time we get in our mid-30s that are almost non-existent. Had prolotherapy leak into the joint uh, during a C-arm procedure, even though the needle wasn't even in the joints. Face blue, smiling. Maybe you had it leak epidural. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the concerns. You, do, you wouldn't want to put high-dose prolotherapy, meaning 12 or 15 percent dextrose, for example, in the joint and have it go into the epidural space because that, that could injure that uh, epidural uh, or the epidural nerve plexus there. Uh, be one of the reasons why you wouldn't do intraarticular prolotherapy, like play the lysate or PRP into the joint, which are a net positive for those nerves. Uh, prolotherapy is neurotoxic unless you bring the percentage way, way down to something like 5%. Uh, Isabella, have you ever had patients sensitive to lidocaine and the prolotherapy causing blurry vision, tinnitus, hearing loss for months? Does this ever fully go away? Um, yeah, you're probably not sensitive as much as they got lidocaine into an artery. Um, and this is one of the problems with blind prolotherapy. Um, uh, so prolotherapy without guidance always risks getting that stuff into an artery. And if it was in the upper cervical spine and they got into the vertebral artery, it could certainly cause everything you're saying here, and that would cause um, nervous system injury because lidocaine would be neurotoxic, just like marcaine, um, if it were injected into neural tissue via the blood vessel. Um, so one of the reasons why we always talk about guidance, why we always talk about digital traction angiography, all of that stuff, will it go away? A lot depends on what got injured with regard to the neural structures, but it's not just sensitivity to lidocaine. Usually in those cases, it is that there was a frank lidocaine injection um, and also hypertonic solution injection, which is the prolotherapy part, into an artery, which then went to neural tissue, i.e. parts of the brain, and that part of the, those cells within the brain got killed off. Uh, Edwin, I, I asked about the PPP muscle tears. You mentioned muscle problems. What else do you guys treat? I've heard about typical or fake injuries. Blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, so we uh, tend to treat, uh, if we've got someone with small muscle tears, we will treat with PPP. If we have someone with muscle atrophy, we will treat with PPP. That's what I meant. Uh, Levon, it's a good idea to get a lumbar puncture check for IIH if you have a lot of indications for it, partially empty cella, excess CSF, accumulation of the brain, dural ectasia of optic nerve sheaths. Um, I don't think an opening lumbar pressure is going to tell us much. This is something I always talk to providers and patients about. If what you're going to get is a sophisticated pressure monitoring catheterization, where they're going to put a catheter up into here from way down there, then sure, that could be some very valuable information. But if they're just going to be looking at the pressure in the lumbar spine, I don't know that that's going to get to an accurate diagnosis. And putting a hole in the dura is to get information that's not going to be helpful is not a good idea. Now, if we're going to be putting a hole in the dura, because we're going to float a catheter up here and get intracranial pressure monitoring, then that's a different story. But you know that's normally not what's done in that clinical scenario, meaning it should be done, but it's typically not because the providers who are doing it don't have the expertise on how to do that. Um, okay, guys, well, it is 2.04, so we're getting to an hour and five minutes, so I'm gonna start wrapping this one up here. Um, I'll see. If I can just answer one or two quick questions. Isabella, is there any way to get lidocaine out of the system quicker and reduce the negative effects or just wait it out? Um, yeah, Isabella, I, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but from what you're describing, it's not a sensitivity reaction. You know, the lidocaine has long since been out of your system. It was deactivated within hours 
Um, so there's no more lidocaine in your system. There hasn't been for months. Um, probably what you're describing, and again, I'd have to do a physical exam, look at all your imaging, et cetera. But when I hear a patient describe something like this, it's that there was uh, brain tissue damage because an artery was inadvertently injected during blind, uh, non-image guided uh, prolotherapy. And um, it's like any brain injury, right? Uh, if, the, if you're young and the body can rewire that area, then that'll happen over months to years. If um, that area can't be um, rewired because there's no neuroplasticity or little uh, neuroplasticity, then it may not get better at all. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we always talk about all the sophisticated imaging guidance stuff. And one of the things that, one of the reasons why I get a little upset when I hear that in 2023, there's still people out there sticking needles in people's necks that don't have fluoroscopy, digital subtraction, angiography, or at the very least, sophisticated ultrasound guidance to make sure they're not injecting into an artery. Um, so I, I know that's probably not what you want to hear, but it is, to me, the thing that explains what you're describing the best. Um, uh, obviously, the caveat being I don't have all of the information here. Um, so it, but it's certainly not that there's still lidocaine still in your system. Uh, happy to help. Happy to help. Okay, guys, so thanks for all the great questions. Again, I always say that's why uh, I do this, is to try to answer patient questions, because educated patients always make much better clinical decisions than patients that are uneducated or patients uh, who are trying to get educated from Facebook uh, groups. Um, having said that, there's some great Facebook groups out there that are run really, really tight. Uh, one of those is the one uh, run on the PICL procedure. Um, uh, but I've also seen Facebook groups that are just full of just half truths, quarter truths, and misinformation. Um, so again, that's why I do this is to try to educate patients. Uh, so thanks so much for taking the time today. We talked today about scoliosis and how that it can impact craniocervical instability or at least produce uh, CCI type symptoms and kyphoscoliosis, that forward head posture and side bent spine. Uh, you guys have a, a great week. Um, let's see, this coming Friday, I believe, I believe I'll be here. I might switch it to Thursday. I'll have to see how things go. I think I've got a meeting coming up on this Friday, but I don't know if it's in the morning or the afternoon uh, to try to see if I'm here. But I'll, I'll probably be doing this next week, suffice it to say. Uh, you all have a great weekend and a great week, and I'll, I'll see you next week. Thank you.